send photos. But you can text 911 and you tell them your name, you tell them your location and what is happening. They will respond back. You'll get those same triage questions as if you were on the phone with them. So if you're, um, a lot of incidents that they uh, developed that for is domestic violence situations where you don't want them to hear you on the phone. If you're on a transit and you see somebody with a weapon who's holding on to it, pulling it out, putting it away, that kind of a thing, you can text 911 if you don't want those people to hear you um, reporting that call. Uh, so if you call non-emergency, have you guys done the little triage buttons, all that fun stuff, you gotta press one, press one, press two, get through that. So, oh, for operator, press zero. It'll kick you through the queue. It's, it only saves you a couple of minutes, but those couple of minutes might make the difference in you waiting for 20 minutes and you waiting for five minutes on that call. You could still end up waiting a long time. That's when the online reporting comes in. On your magnet, Mark referred to um, the online reporting option, and it is in the flow chart. It explains what stuff you cannot report online. If you find a gun, if you find prescription medications, um, I believe like hit and runs, you can't report those things online. It is in the flow chart, and if you go to the, um, the Portland Bureau, our uh, Portland Police Bureau website, it's like big fat red text and font, and it's got like all these giant bullets. I mean, it's like 30 point font. You can't really not read it. It's like super easy to read on a white background. Very clear about what you can and cannot report online, but it can save you a lot of time. A lot of the stuff that you're gonna see in the parks is gonna go to the rangers, but if you see stuff that goes outside of the parks, you may also want to file a police report. And so if it goes outside of the parks, the rangers will have to call the police, so the police can respond because they're gonna work together about what happened here, but if that person exits the park, the rangers can't do anything anymore, so now you gotta contact the police. So knowing that you might have to contact more than one person to get a bigger situation resolved is really, really important. Um, so when you call 911 in non-emergency, we're gonna go over um, the information that you're going to want to get. So Mark touched on making sure that the information, especially suspicious activity, that's a lot of the stuff you're going to report in and around the parks, is suspicious activity. Activity is the behavior that the person is exhibiting and the acts that they are committing. It is not what they look like, it is not um, their living situation. If you guys have never heard of the Anderson Agreement, it's a lot of information and I really, really encourage you guys to go and read it. <laughs> Housing is a protected status. It's the same as ethnicity, race, gender, age, all of that stuff, it falls into that same category. You are not being, you are not a criminal solely based on the fact that you are experiencing houselessness in any situation, the same as if you are a female or a male or any other identified gender or race or any of that kind of stuff. So what your goal here at the end of the night is to know that you're identifying the behavior when you're reporting anything. Anything to anybody is the behavior. Identifying is it criminal, is it a violation, um, or is it anything that I can do at all? And maybe it's just having a conversation with that person if you feel comfortable enough to go up to them. Sometimes if you see somebody that you're uncomfortable with, Mark wants to do the kill them with kindness. So you're gonna say, hey, I haven't seen you around the park before. Are you frequent here? I've never, I've never noticed. Oh, do you live around the neighborhood? Oh, we have a park watch here. Would you be interested in joining? If that's kind of the, if you're comfortable doing that kind of stuff. Otherwise, just making simple eye contact is good enough for a lot of people. People who are doing things that they shouldn't be doing don't like to be observed. They don't like to be noticed. So they're gonna try to hold back and not be um, addressed. And if you feel uncomfortable addressing people, don't do it. Don't go outside of your real house. But also, part of the, the park watch and all of our neighborhood watch programs is non-confrontational. It doesn't mean you can't talk to people. It means that you're not going to address them in an aggressive way and say, get the hell out of my park, I don't want to here. You're gonna talk to them like a normal human being and address normal things and you're going to ask them how they're doing are you a frequenter here if you think that they're talking themselves or swinging around some kind of a weapon maybe don't talk to them and just so you know i had a question nunchucks are a weapon you guys okay if somebody is standing on the corner swinging around nunchucks that's a 911 or non-emergency call i had a, somebody ask me that the other day that is a weapon so if you're not sure what the weapon is if they're swinging something around potentially talking to themselves or yelling at people as they go by, stepping in front of them. That is aggressive behavior. And then you can call 911 or non-emergency, uh, depending on how you feel about what that behavior is exhibiting at the time. Is it an immediate threat to somebody? Or is it that person is not really harming anyone, but they are swinging something around, I can't tell if it's knife. Never lie, never exaggerate when you call 911 or non-emergency. Especially when the police show up and they know it was obvious that you're lying, you're not gonna get a happy officer, which might then result in pretty poor customer service after that point. So. When you are calling, if you guys go to page 13, it talks about um, identifying and reporting. So when you call BOAC, so Bureau of Emergency Communications, I use a lot of acronyms. If you don't know what they mean or if you forget, feel free to ask me. Most of it's in the packet as well for later reference. Um, they are going to ask you the seven W's. So it's who, what, when, where, why, and then the big two are weapons and warnings. Weapons and warnings are not just for police. Emergency personnel, rangers, 
all these different people are going to be responding to those calls. If they have weapons, if they are doing something that is potentially dangerous, it might not be something that your ranger can handle. It might be something that is potentially dangerous and requires police presence. So you can inform your ranger, let them know, hey, they've got a weapon as well, and then they can either call the officer or you can call the police and say there's somebody in the park who has a weapon and they're doing these, these things. And uh, if you guys forget everything that I teach you about reporting and all of this information, it's all in your packets. And the call takers are really, really, really well trained. They're going to ask you all these questions anyways. You having this kind of in mind already just helps you so you're prepared. If you have any kind of writing material on you and you're calling on emergency too, I encourage you guys to write stuff down as you're sitting on hold because you think you'll remember it and then they start asking you questions and your brain just goes and you're not going to remember anything because now you're having, if they ask you a question you weren't prepared for, now you got to think about that question and then you could lose key in a So um, the questions that we're going to ask you when identifying a suspect, this is where those other things come in handy, okay? You're not calling and reporting suspicious behavior um, because of the way the person looks, but it is good to be able to identify somebody, okay? So you're going to be looking at the head to toe reporting. Boak is going to ask you head to toe reporting. What color hair do they have? Um, how tall were they? Were they male? Were they female? Can you identify key identifiers? Did they have tattoos? Did they have any of that kind of stuff? Um, the best way to identify somebody is things that they cannot change or are unlikely to change in a very fast situation. So if you just saw somebody mug somebody in the park and they're running off, you're calling 911. You want to be able to do that head to toe real quick. So um, I don't know your name, sorry, but if everybody could stay looking at me, there's a gentleman on the table over there. Can anybody tell me what color jacket he's wearing? In the very far right corner, he's the furthest in the front. So, yeah, so he's wearing a red jacket, and it is a quite a right, bright red jacket. That's part of that observation piece. When you're going out and you're seeing things, making eye contact with people, you're more likely to remember what they look like. So I'm not saying you'd stare at them for 10 minutes and watch them <laughs> as they walk by, but making brief <laughs> eye contact, you're going to be more likely to remember what that person looked like. And you're going to want to look for facial hair, color of their hair, is it long, is it short, do they have tattoos, do they have scars? And then one key thing, and it's good for also for your children, if you have any children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, or you're a babysitter, if you're taking a child out, can you imagine what is one thing that somebody's probably not going to change about themselves when they're running away from the police? Shoes. A lot of the time they're not going to take the time to take off their shoes and change their flip-flops or do whatever they're doing. They're going to leave their shoes on, pull on a jacket, pull on sweats, pull off sweats, put on a hat, drop their backpack, pick up a backpack, grab a bike, that kind of stuff. But they're not going to stop and change their shoes. The same goes with children. They're not going to know what size shoe that child that they've been waiting around the park is for. They're going to do it at a time of opportunity. So if you know what shoes your child is wearing, if you know what shoes the suspect is wearing, that can be something that gives the difference between probable cause and reasonable suspicion. We're going to touch on the key terminology with that a little bit later, and that helps the officers so they can do their job. It's a huge difference, and it makes a difference in making an arrest versus saying, I'm sorry, have a nice day. And also with your guys' frustration levels. So the next thing that we're going to touch on is um, reporting vehicles. So symbols is a quick acronym that you guys can try to utilize, and it's symbols with a C, you know, an S. And that's what BOEC uses for reporting. And it's um, color, gear, make, body style, um, other marks and damages, broken windows, thrown out tail lights, um, different types, like those kinds of things, slashed items on it, whatever. And then license and state. So the key and important information, even if you get a single letter or number on that license, even if you don't know what state it was, but you saw the color of it, a lot of the call takers are trained and they do it so much that they know what those states look like, they know what those colors are. Any information that you could potentially give, if the call taker doesn't know it, they're gonna take those notes, the officer might know it. Somebody might know what that information means and it can mean something to anybody. So any key detail is really important. And then the efficiency of how you're utilizing their time <laughs> is also dependent on how much information you can give them. And that's again, the probable cause versus reasonable suspicion type of thing. So one example of that, the, I always give this example at all my trainings because it's so perfect on it. I was driving the Ilani Casino. You guys know that was built in Vancouver. So I live up north. I actually commute into work every day. Um, and I, um, in that that was happening, there was a woman at the casino. She shot her boyfriend with a shotgun that was in the back of their truck, took their dog, broke into a car, and drove off. Okay? So all they had on that vehicle was that it was a <coughs> Mazda with a white female, um, her late 20s, early 30s, and she had a dog. And she was heading northbound just off the Ilani Casino. Well, I went home early that day from work. And I was driving up north, and right about maybe two minutes after that happened, I'm passing the Alana Casino in my blue Mazda. And I'm driving home. And I see one pacer car on my left as an officer, and I'm in the center lane, my cruise control on, and I was at 60, so I was not speeding at all. And I know what a pace is like, so he's pacing me in the fast lane, doesn't drive by, 
drops back, then they're pacing me on my right side, then I notice there's two officers pacing on both sides, and then an officer's car behind me, and all the lights go on. So I pull over, <laughs> and I got them yelling at me to get my hands out the window, stick my hands where they can see them, not to move them outside of the window. They're coming up, and they're asking me to unlock the doors with which hand, and I'm doing that, and they ask me to pop the trunk because they're looking for the dog, which I left home early that day to bring my dog to the vet. So I could have brought him to work, thank goodness I didn't. I would have been totally helped. And um, I complied, and of course, I, I like to carry my own protection. I have like a, a knife with me, I have pepper spray, so they're asking, do you have any weapons in the car or on your person? Yeah, I do, and I'm just sitting there with my hands up there, so <laughs> I'm doing everything they ask. Well, I had five officers that were there, and I did not shoot my boyfriend and take the dog and steal a vehicle. They didn't have a partial plate, the owner of the vehicle didn't know what their license plate number was, and so in that short period of time, they didn't have enough information. All they had is a white female and a blue Mazda heading northbound. And they obviously, they had not utilized their time to the best of their ability because they pulled me over. And if they would have had any partial plate, mine's a Washington plate, she could have been an Oregon plate. That would have made all the difference in the world and they wouldn't have even taken a second look at me and they would have kept going. I had tinted windows too, so I guess that's my fault because they couldn't tell if I had a dog in the car. But that's just an example of utilizing their time efficiently and the more information you can give, the better. And if you ever forget something or remember something later on, you can always call non-emergency and add to that report number. So there's report numbers and incident numbers and it's really important to remember. Every time you call and you um, report something, there's not always a police report filed. So that's important to remember. The officers have the discretion to file or not file a police report. They could just put in uh, the information in the CAD in that incident report. The incident report is not through Portland Police Bureau. To receive that incident report, you have to call the Bureau of Emergency Communications and have that incident report. If you ever call in, ask them at the end of that call, what is the incident report number? And if you talk to an officer, ask the officer if you file a police report. Another key thing is, if you want to be contacted by an officer, say it's a small matter and you know you might not get contacted, but you want to be contacted, ask to be contacted by an officer. They have a little box that they check that says, please follow up with this person. If you don't want to be contacted by an officer because you're afraid people are going to retaliate to you, you don't want them showing up at your door, make sure and tell those call takers that. Okay? And if, if you, uh, excuse me, my mouth's getting a little dry, I'm talking so fast. Okay. So, and then the other key thing is if your officer calls and, and that, make sure you guys are cordial to them. Make sure you're, 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 let them know that you appreciate Because a lot of the time they don't have the time to make those calls. A lot of people get really angry. They say, hey, I called about this incident that happened. There was a suspicious person. And then I realized I had more information on them. And I called the police bureau to get the police report and there was no police report. Well, it's because it was a suspicious person report and they probably didn't file a police report on it because there was no follow up and nothing they could do about it. But there is an incident report number. Every time you call the Bureau of Emergency Communications, they have an incident report number. Make sure to ask for that number when you're done with the call on there. Um, if you do have some interactions with your police officers, so on the front of your guys' packet, there was this nice little folded piece, and it is for independent police review. A lot of people contact independent police review, and it opens up all the way, guys. Um, they contact them when they want to complain about an officer. They're not just used for complaints. The front of the thing says complaints and combinations. So they have a lot of different services. They have mediation services, they have um, complaint services, and they have um, commendations. Commendations is kudos, good job. When you have a good interaction with an officer, everybody is really quick to tell an officer when they're doing something wrong. But they also do good things. And it might not just be that one time. Maybe you have the officer, that district officer who's coming through and doing stuff all the time and he's always getting back to you guys. He's always checking on you guys, stopping and saying hi. You guys can send in that good information too. They do have a phone number on there and they do have an office that you can go into um, in City Hall. Yeah. So in City Hall. So you can go, um, you can get to get checked because they got security going in. But there's a lot of different ways and resources that you can contact them and they have a lot of information that you can get and they have a whole process. And if you ever feel like there's something that you want to talk about or you're not sure if you really need to file a complaint against them or how the commendations work, you can just give them a call. They're really great and they've got a really good process and I encourage you guys to use them because they also have a great um, tracking information that you can utilize and you can even go in and see what kind of stuff is getting um, reported about your officers, good and bad, and it makes a big difference to the officers as well. One of the things you can also do if you have a good or bad experience and you um, lost this information you can't remember about IPR, you guys are always welcome to call your precinct and talk to a supervisor there or talk to your district officers. If you want to know about what their patrol is that's going on, you guys can call there, call your precinct, and you guys are East Precinct. Um, and that information is, I know it's on here somewhere, on page 19. And 
Um, you can ask mm -hmm. them, hey, I haven't seen any officers in my district. Is there an assigned district officer? If there isn't an assigned district officer,